The last six words in our mission, which I'm passionate about, are for the ultimate benefit of society. And uh, really, that's what we're trying to connect finance and investment management to, is a sense of purpose. Hello, I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson. Welcome to Ethics in Business, in their own words. To celebrate the fifth annual Global Ethics Day in October 2018, ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, has teamed up with Carnegie Council and CFA Institute to produce this interview series. It features global business leaders exploring how businesses are preparing for an ethical future in the face of threats and challenges presented by globalization, technology, and human psychology. Today, we are talking to Paul Smith, President and CEO of CFA Institute. CFA Institute is the global association for investment management professionals with over 150,000 members and 151 local member societies worldwide. Its mission is to lead the investment profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence. CFA Institute believes it's vital that those in financial services maintain high ethical principles, which are essential to protecting investors, functioning markets, and growing economies. What role does CFA Institute play in the community? Well, I guess we have uh, two roles. One as an employer, uh, and uh, we have offices from Charlottesville in Virginia, which is our headquarters, through to Beijing in China. Uh, and so we obviously have a responsibility, as far as that is concerned, to be uh, a diverse uh, employer and an employer who thinks about its carbon footprint and the way we uh, impact uh, the environment in around our offices. But um, on a wider context, we have something like 163,000 members around the world uh, in 165 countries. Uh, and we also have uh, 320,000 candidates as well. So 500,000 people in our uh, ecosystem, if you like, in many, many countries, and our responsibility there is to provide education that helps them be thoughtful citizens of the planet we all inhabit. So it seems as though the uh, CFA Institute's tentacles are a little bit everywhere. What are some specific philanthropic efforts that CFA Institute is undertaking? Um, well, I think the biggest one that we're doing at the moment is around women in investment management. So the impact there, uh, it was a project that was started in India, in fact, in, uh, in uh, Mumbai, uh, where we've taken 49 young women, we, originally it was 50, but one young lady dropped out of the program, um, 49 young women uh, who didn't have access to financial education and didn't have the aspiration, really, to think that their professional careers could take them into finance. Um, and we put them through something that we rather sort of inelegantly call a boot camp, which is sort of a, a four to five week training program. And then working with industry partners, uh, we got each of them a six month internship with an asset management company in India, which was also paid. So that was very important. We don't believe in abusing our young people in terms of unpaid internships uh, and put them through that. Uh, and that's been a huge success. And as a result of that, the G7 uh, under Canada's current leadership have uh, noticed that program and are working with us to fund that in up to nine other countries around the world over the next three years. So that, for me, is perhaps one of the most uh, important contributions that we're making, uh, trying to contribute to the cognitive diversity, if you like, within the investment profession. So Canada has picked up on mm. your model. Yes, it has. Explain the concept of the model. Well, the concept of the model is, is that um, young women often, uh, for various reasons, don't think about finance as a career. Uh, you know, obviously in the Western world, perhaps they've seen Billions or the Wolf of, Wolf of Wall Street or something like that, and it's bizarrely not something that they necessarily wish to put themselves through. Um, and our challenge as investment professionals is to explain that that really isn't an accurate picture of the way that our world works. And I think the second sort of deeper reason is that we have really failed as an industry to talk about the purpose of what we do. Um, I think young women, too many young women, think of it as a very, A, a male-dominated, which is true, but B, very selfish profession that's focused solely on enriching the participants within the profession. And what we have done a very poor job of is explaining that actually 
investment management is quite a noble profession. That without us, uh, particularly in the developing world where it's easier to see, you know, roads don't get built, hospitals don't get built, schools don't get built, people aren't able to plan for retirement. And our profession has done a lousy job, really, of trying to put that forward to young people to attract them into the profession. And as a result, we have a very uh, ethnically undiverse profession and also a very uh, poorly uh, diverse profession from a background perspective. Everyone tends to have gone to the elite schools in whatever country they're from, um, tend to be male, tend to be very middle class. Uh, and uh, the result of that is, is that we lack uh, cognitive diversity um, to help us solve some of the problems that we have in the world and to help us relate better to our clients. And this seems to be a trend that you're seeing. And how do you mainstream it more then? Well, that's, that's a great question. And, and obviously, it's a, it, it, it's a challenge. Well, the first thing we've got to do is to convince the profession that this is a problem. So it's a bit like turkeys voting for Thanksgiving or, or whatever in my country we would say Christmas. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a challenge to convince a bunch of middle-aged, middle-class white men, particularly, that, um, you know, that they should try and open things up a little bit more. So that's the first challenge. Uh, I think in a wider context, talking about cognitive diversity is not such a problem. But getting into universities and high schools and uh, convincing young women obviously is a huge task. And we're trying to do that, and we're very active in that regard. We have some 500 universities around the world that we work closely with. Um, but it is, uh, you know, that's, that's the battle, and it's not going to be won overnight. It's a, it's a, a generational uh, activity. Uh, and it's largely uh, a hearts and minds campaign, and obviously that's going to take a long while. How are you managing your impact on the environment? Right. Well, um, we're really at the start of our journey as far as that's concerned. We, we, we're quite good as far as our buildings are concerned. Um, so internally, we, we are very thoughtful about that. We travel too much. That is a, and I am unfortunately the worst example of that. Um, so we're trying to figure that out at the moment. And we've done a carbon footprint study of the organization. Um, so we've gone that far and now we're trying to uh, actually figure out, well, what are we going to do with that information? Um, so we're, we're sort of, I would say, at level one on a sort of a three to four stage process of trying to improve our own internal footprint. And there are lots of things uh, that we've got to think about within that. We have uh, quite a large endowment. Uh, how's that managed? And uh, is that being thoughtfully done? But more importantly, again, coming back to what I was saying earlier on, we have this 500,000 group of individuals and that really through our curriculum and through continuing professional development activities um, trying to get through to that larger audience that they also have a responsibility alongside of ourselves is is part of the battle you know you you touched on this a little bit in uh, one of your answers just a little bit ago but i want to ask you again to focus a bit on how does cfa institute work to create diversity mm. in the investment industry well, it's a country by country conversation. So diversity as a, a, a specific challenge tends to be more focused on the Western world. So countries like my own in the UK and in the EU uh, and here in America and Canada as well, where we are trying to reach out to uh, minority communities and talk about what we're doing. So we have scholarship programs that are targeted towards some minority uh, uh, communities to try and uh, encourage them into our education. Uh, but more importantly, we're just trying to win the battle on saying that a more diverse uh, profession will serve a diverse client base better and also a more diverse thought process will uh, inevitably result in better investment solutions for a complicated world. There's lots of academic research around that uh, to prove that out. There's lots of academic research around how diverse investment teams will produce better results than non-diverse investment teams. But as I said earlier, uh, it's not something today that uh, the vast majority of investment professionals will agree with. And depressingly, it's not something that the majority of female CFAs agree with either. So that's interesting. That is interesting. We've seen in the tech industry, for instance, STEM programs mm. starting in, in high school and even middle schools. How does CFA Institute plan on implementing something like that in the younger ages yep. to to get girls and minorities and other groups interested. Yep. 
Well, we have, we have something called Investment Foundations, which is a junior program, which is very definitely geared, it's free, um, and it's geared towards high schools and middle schools to help um, kids sort of get the start in terms of financial education. So that's there. Our challenge is that this isn't in the main, as some states are different in the US, but in the main, it's not part of the curriculum. So the biggest challenge has been talking to school boards about saying that uh, financial literacy, to give it a sort of a more popular populist term, is something that should really be thought about within the educational curriculum. And that, uh, alas, is not a winning battle at the moment. So most of the activities that we have as an institute are uh, philanthropic, to use a term that you used earlier, where a lot of our groups of CFAs around the nation, which we call uh, CFA societies, and we have about 80 of those in the US in the various cities around the country, um, they actually have their own initiatives. The challenge with that is that each one, as you kind of said, sort of picks a different piece of this. Um, some might look at it from a, a disadvantaged community perspective, some might look at it middle school issues, some might look at it as young adults, uh, people who've already left the school system who are you know, discounting payday checks and things of that nature and how can, how can we give practical support uh, to families where often no one's had a bank account, for instance. And uh, you know, just, just, just on that level, trying to help young people uh, understand the banking system, credit card debt, uh, how to manage their uh, weekly finances is, um, is, um, is a big effort. Um, but that's kind of philanthropic as opposed to baked in the cake. Well, it, it sounds like the spectrum is very broad of what CFA Institute does. Yes, no, we, we're, what well, you use the term, I hope we're a benign octopus, something with these tentacles everywhere. Uh, we're a cuddly octopus, if that's not a, um, a contradiction in terms. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and we take that, um, I mean, our mission, uh, uh, the last six words in our mission, which I, I'm passionate about, are for the ultimate benefit of society. And uh, really, that's what we're trying to connect finance and investment management to, is a sense of purpose is that there is a point to what we do, and the point to what we do is to help everybody in society um, uh, fulfill their financial aspirations. And I, again, coming up to something I said earlier, and I get laughed at for saying it, that's actually quite a noble uh, cause, and we should be proud of ourselves, and we should talk more forcefully about it, that um, we are well-motivated uh, and a key part of how society functions. How does CFA Institute help investment professionals and firms adapt to technological change? Right. Well, I, I, th through the curriculum, again, financial technology uh, is a key part of our profession nowadays. And a lot of people, a lot of outside commentators will say that the financial profession is about to have its uber moment or however one, however one describes that. And I think to a certain extent it's true, whether it's on... Uh, uh, asset management techniques or product construction and distribution. Uh, technology is revolutionizing our profession and for the better because it is helping us be more transparent, uh, more consistent and more scalable. So clients will get a hugely improved service as a result of financial technology. It'll be cheaper for them, they'll understand it more, uh, it'll be more accessible, more consistent and better reported to them. So. It's, for me, it's the best thing that's happened to our profession because it's taking away decades of mumbo-jumbo that we have sort of confused the general public with. And that's one of the reasons why I think we have this challenge of connecting to purpose because we've overcomplicated what is a very simple uh, business. We're talking, of course, in honor of Global Ethics Day. Yes. I want you to tell me about the role of ethics as being core to professionalizing the investment industry? Well, um, ethics firstly is, is uh, at the core of everything that we teach. So 10% of our program is based on uh, ethical, or, uh, ethical teaching, which is based on something that we call our, our code of conduct. So every charter holder, everyone who's got the three letters after their name, CFA, has to annually sign an attestation that they have uh, lived uh, their professional life in accordance with our code of conduct at all times during the previous 12 months. So that's a great statement as far as the public is concerned that a charter holder is ethically committed. 
What does that mean? Well, in essence, ethics is putting yourself in your client's shoes. It's no more complicated than that. If you're dealing with me as a financial professional, your job as a financial professional is to say, if I were the other side of the table, would I be happy with the way that I'm being dealt with? Nothing more than that. And when you, and when you think about what a professional is, I always, I always like to torture the medical profession as far as that is my, as my analogy. And I know, I know people can, can beat up on doctors a lot, but basically when you sit in front of a doctor, you believe that she or he is advising you in your best interests. And that's what we have to establish in the minds of our clients when they're sitting in front of their financial advisor. And today, alas, I think most people sitting in front of their financial advisor will sort of say, well, because it will invariably be a male, um, what's his angle, really? And until we can get over that barrier and make people, make our clients feel that we are uh, really looking at things from their perspective, then we can't really truly call ourselves either a profession or an ethical profession either. And so that's, that's the essence of it. Put yourself in your client's shoes and do as you would be done by. 